We're getting back on track here with Catherine and Emily, but as you know, we won't stay there for long because this is the Going Off Track podcast. Hello, hello, and welcome back to the Going Off Track podcast. I'm Catherine, and that's Emily, who's back, finally. I am. I'm back. I'm back in America. We're back on great Wi-Fi. We no longer have a seven-second delay. Hopefully, it doesn't yes. take 10 hours to upload our episodes anymore. Go oh, team. my gosh. Uh, so excited. Not miss those days. I'll miss Argentina, obviously, but I'm very, very glad to be back on U.S. soil. Strictly With American Wi-Fi. Again. With American Wi-Fi, exactly. And also um, easy yeah, access no. to Target. <laughs> oh my gosh, I haven't even been to Target yet, Catherine. But I went to HEB, which is like our big grocery store, and I just walked around through every single aisle, and I got way too much. I'm so excited, though, for all of the foods that I've missed. I have eaten ranch dressing at every single meal. Oh, yay. So, yeah, it's big, big. I had tacos as soon as I landed, so that was great. Haven't had barbecue yet, but I will eventually. So, but because normally when I come back, I have to like pack everything into every single day. So, like right. breakfast, I have bacon, and lunch, I go somewhere to get food, and dinner, I try and eat out, and I try and pack a million things into two weeks, and I feel so sick because I've eaten so much food. But now that I'm back for good, I don't have to do that. So I'll slowly get around to everything. <laughs> yeah, you, you, you've you got time. And then in the continuing adventures of what are we going to hear in the background of Catherine's recordings, <laughs> um, I am, as you can tell, not currently at camp because I am in a real home. Um, I am at my mom's first intercession. And if you hear any weird grunting in the background, it's my mother's dog who's trying to bathe herself at 600 years old. So and she's just very, she's very loud at the moment if it picks up on the microphone. <laughs> Oh, well, in the, you know, never ending what's going on in Emily's podcasting studio, um, I'm in my parents' guest bedroom because I'm 31 years old living with my parents again. Um, and both dogs, my dog and my parents' dog, keeps hitting the door trying to get in. <laughs> but once they come in here, all they do is play and it's obnoxious and loud. So stay tuned. Dogs yep. just ruining episodes. So that's right. Yes, it is. That is that is where we we are. We are surrounded by animals, but I'm currently not surrounded by children, which is a nice little bit of a break. I know. I was going to ask you how camp's been going because I've been gone for you know two weeks on my leave, we'll call it. Um, mm-hmm. And I, I just I'm so I was so invested in the bagpipers, and I'm really sad <laughs> that they're gone. Um, you you may be really sad them. that they're gone, but um, we are really happy that the bagpipers are gone. The bagpipers <laughs> were very um, quickly replaced by a soccer camp, and then a football camp, and now there's another mm-hmm. camp. So there's two camps, one property, lots of people, um, but no bagpipes um, to to speak of, though they are referenced pretty much daily. Um, so we, we miss the idea of the bagpipers without actually missing the bagpipers and the noise themselves. Love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Oh, well, it's good to be back. I've missed it. I have mm-hmm. was, I mean, I'm pretty sure I've sent every single F1 meme to you, Catherine, like multiple yes. times because I, that's our only communication right now. Cause I'm not recording or I wasn't recording. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. No, no, leave it. Kona tried to eat an apple. Ooh, no, not the apple, not the core. No, we're, Kona. we're just gonna we're just gonna put that on the table. I'd say bad dog, but she's like eight hundred years old, so she kind of just, you know, Exists. does what she wants. Yes. Um. Anyway. Anyway. As we were saying, I'm not gonna cut this out because it's just too funny. I'm really happy to be back. I feel like all I did for two weeks was send you F1 memes. And yeah, yeah. To I mean, watch races while I was in remote locations. So yeah, I mean, how how was that? What because you 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 missed Austria and Silverstone. Um, how how was that? Um, watching while you know on your little uh, South American adventures. Well, Catherine, let's go back to the beginning of when Verizon dropped my phone plan <laughs> randomly. <laughs> So I lost all connection to everything. I no longer had a phone number. I didn't have a SIM. Somehow my SIM got like deleted. So I had to get a random like international phone plan, which obviously I don't have service on. And I was in Iguazu, which is in the very north, which like touches Paraguay and Brazil. Service isn't great. You're basically in the jungle. Um, So I had no Wi-Fi. So I missed Austria completely Mm because I had literally no connection. And then for Silverstone... We were in Mendoza, 
And by then, like, we have a little bit better connection. But I, but then I got kicked off my Hulu account. Oh <laughs> so my god! I couldn't log into Hulu. So I'm like literally refreshing live feeds and stuff. Jesus and I'm like, oh Christ, my god! Oh my god! Stop that! This fucking I'm gonna put you away. Bye, Kona. So you were in Mendoza, you lost your Hulu account. Yes. And so I had to like refresh every single live feed I could find. And then ESPN kept like going back to like previous laps. I'm like, no, that's not where we are. And it was obnoxious, but I, you know, I struggled. And now that I'm back here and I can actually sit and watch it live on a TV, I'm very excited. I'm not excited about the time I will have to wake up to watch them. It's not as early as Catherine but it is earlier than I've been accustomed to for the last two and a half years. So welcome to my life. Yeah. I I don't (laughs) even know. So obviously we are off this week um, as you, as you watch this, as it it releases. And then we've got hungry up next and hungry starts at 6am. So that'll be fun for me. I know it's 8am for me because I think I'm two hours ahead of you. Yeah. You're you're two hours up. Yeah. 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 So yay. Yay. Um, 10 or 11, but that that's true yeah so why don't we just talk about those races what did you think about George Wynn in Austria and then of course everything that happened between Max and Lando and all that Red Bull McLaren drama nonsense that seems to be in the past at this point so in sticking with the theme of this episode of it being from the DMs I'm pretty sure when George won I said I fucking hate him or something along those lines yeah um I don't know why, but I'm just turning into such like a negative Nancy around George. I really don't like him. I can't tell you what it is. Like you just look at him and you're like, why? No, like there something irks me. And case in point, him at Wimbledon. Yeah. Uh, or Wimbledon. I just, I don't know why I said that with a T. It, he, mm, it just, I don't get it. I don't get it. He looks like a, like a preppy school kid who like potentially bullied other children and I I just don't get it I don't he's probably a really great guy that's fine I just he really irks me and it was really frustrating so George's win in Austria I wasn't a fan to the Max and Lando piece of it like I think the media blew it up and made it such a bigger thing way out of proportion of, like are you gonna apologize you should apologize like you um, and it's just like He's like, go away. Like, Lando and I are going to have a little chit-chat. We did. Everything's fine. We're great. We're good friends. That's all I care about. Whatever. So I think it just turned into, like, a big nothing burger. And yeah. everyone was freaking out about it. I will say, when you sent me that picture of George at Wimbledon, my I said to you, um, he looks like the villain in some high-fashion comedy television series. Fas- that, fashion. That, <laughs> that description is so so dead on um but I don't know I just he either needs a stylist or he needs to get rid of his current stylist I don't know it's he's just never well dressed he just is I just don't understand his vibe I feel like he's well dressed but I don't think he's well dressed for who he is fair fair point yeah I think like his outfit at Wimbledon I feel like someone else could have really pulled it off him it fell very short it felt very stiff. And then to to move on from, from that and George, um, what did you think of Lewis's uh, historic, historic for the sport win at Silverstone? So I'm not going to lie. I did get a little sensey and emotional. Oh, yeah. I know I'm not the biggest. I'm not the biggest like Lewis fan um, on track, off track. I'm a huge supporter. We've talked about this multiple times. But just to see like – It's been, it was what, like 900 days or whatever since his last win or something insane like that. And for him to come and win at his home race and have such a historic moment um, in his last year with Mercedes, like, I think it was super cool to see. Um, I don't know. I'm really happy for him. Like, I, he's towards the, I, well, I want to say he's towards the end of his career, but I know Mm -hmm. he's. You know what? Because now he has like what a three-year contract with Ferrari. Fred came out and said he has like a three-year yeah. contract or whatever. Like, it's just nice to see that he's still competitive and doing well. 
I don't know because I like we've talked about this before I want him to stick around in the sport as long as possible because he's so good for the sport he's such a champion for you know really positive change and um and women in the sport so I think he's really great to have on track and and seeing him still be competitive and sticking around because no one wants like an old person who's not competitive sitting in a car anymore you know what I mean right um so it's good to see I I was really happy for him well, yeah you know so I long. obviously there's a whole 50 minute episode of, of you know my mine and my dad's discussion about this and also thank you to yeah. my dad and to Adam for subbing in for Emily while you were gone um yes 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 but yeah you know it, it was significant for the sport I love you know the stat side of things so it was great and if I never have to see Lewis win a Formula One race again I will also be happy <laughs> that's fair that's fair I mean we can't all, you know, can't win them all. Like everybody, you can't win them all. Can't like them all. So, totally fair. Um, yeah. This isn't in like our rundown, but come speaking of like seeing people win races again, I have to come clean on this podcast. I did send Catherine a DM that said, "I think I'm coming around to liking Max Verstappen." <laughs> yes. Which, if you've listened to this podcast since we started like a year ago, um, probably never would have thought those words would come out of my mouth. I'm right there with you. But, you know, there's something about him that's – it. I'm coming around to him. I think I like his, like, don't care attitude, super just like, meh, it is what it is. This is just my job. Um, and his humor. I'm coming around to his humor, too. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, so you heard it here first outside of the DMs. I'm – no longer Max Verstappen's Sub Zero fan. So, Ooh. wow. There we go. Um, moving on to someone else that I want to talk about that, like I, you know, never their number one fan. Um, Lance yeah. Stroll. Mm-hmm. I love how it's like came out and it was like confirmed and it's like no shit. Oh my gosh. Um, but it's like I lo- But it came out that there's a true extension just to 2026, though. So it's no longer, like, an undefined contract, which I wonder – I was wondering, like, you know, tinfoil hat here, if that was intentional so that they can get rid of him and oust him versus, like, him just having this forever contract and them never really being able to – there's Benny – never being able to truly get rid of him. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, I I definitely do. It's – like I say, it's it's interesting, and I still believe that if Aston Martin wants to be a successful top tier Formula One team, they need to move on from Lance. Like I just, you know, we'll we'll talk in a minute about you know all the the people that Lawrence Stroll is hiring, for, you know, at these high levels to join this team. But I, I really think that they're going to need a stronger driver in that second seat. Oh, a thousand percent, and I think honestly, Daddy Stroll knows that too, but. It's really hard to fire your kid. Maybe the love for his son just exceeds the, his love for the, you know, winning. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. We all saw that Drive to Survive episode where he's like, deep down, I'm just a dad. And I was really I worried when my son had a bi- bike okay. accident. Yeah, no, God I... Damn it, what are you doing? Why can't you be in the car? It's yeah. two weeks to the first race. Yeah, it's, you know... It, it, I just, I I get it. And I get that, you know, Lance loves racing. He's obviously good enough to be in Formula One. He's good enough to be a point scorer, even if he is only one single point ahead of Haas's Nico Hulkenberg right now. But, you know, Aston Martin, you know, Lawrence, they have really big ambitions. Obviously Lance does too, but I don't think that Lance is the driver that's going to help them meet those ambitions. And to lock him in in into 2026 um, when Honda comes as their engine supplier, like, there's going to be a gap with Yuki Tsunoda's current contract because he's contracted to um, V-Carb until 2025. So does V-Carb do, do another year with him, even though they don't have the Honda backing? Um, or, you know, what what happens to, to Yuki? Because I think Yuki and Aston Martin could be a good partnership. Unless oh, Yuki okay. ends up taking Fernando's seat. It's literally musical chairs. And I think I know all we do... It ha- all we've done this season is talk about 2025, but I really think we needed to start talking about 2026. Oh my God, I'm dying. I'm dying. This, 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 is, this is getting absurd. It is. It is what do you think is going to be on track in 2030 when we go carbon net zero, whatever it is? Oh my God. Um, well, I think Oscar Piastri might be the the uh, leader of uh, of the squad once we get to, to that point. I, I, can, I can see that. Catherine has said it here first. Predictions being made for 2030. 
God, um, that's so far away. Um, so next, my, you know, favorite forgettable human, um, Pierre Gasly <laughs> signed a multi-year deal with Alpine. Um, that happened while I was out. Also, I love how all this contract movement happened while I was out. Like, of course right? it did. It's my favorite thing to talk about. Um, yeah, and you were so gone. I was so gone. Um, but yeah, so Pierre Gasly is staying with Alpine. Big whoop. Don't care. He'll still be forgettable and he'll be driving a, a uh, forgettable car. Moving on. Um, our man, Ollie Behrman, reserve driver who is still very high in the standings compared to some of the people who have been driving every single race. Um, he signed a multi-year deal with Haas, which I think that's interesting. Not that he's going to Haas, but that he got a multi-year deal because he's a rookie. If we look back we had multiple rookies and they all had one-year contracts and they all had to kind of prove themselves throughout the season to get a spot for this season. Um, we had, you know, everyone re-signed like maybe a one-year deal or whatever. But I think it's super interesting that they're giving Ollie more than just one year to prove himself on track. Yeah, I mean, obviously driving a Ferrari and doing, you know, finishing P7 in a Ferrari is making quite the statement. And he's not going to be in remotely the same car next year, even though apparently right now the Haas doesn't remember that it's bad on Sundays. Um, so it's it's going to be really interesting. And, you know, we don't know what, mul- like, they're, they've been throwing multi-year out a lot instead of giving us, like, contract durations, like two-year, so three-year, which is it's really like annoying. soon. Stop with the vague shit. Stop with the soon. Um, it could, honestly, I think it means three years. But I, I think that it's, I, I really think that this is going to be an opportunity for Haas to be used as a training ground with Ollie to then eventually get him into the Ferrari. Yeah, but if it's three, well, I guess he could take over for Lewis because, mm-hmm. you know, Charles is there forever because he's their golden child. But Right, which I, I think that he's really thrilled about being their golden child right now. <sighs> Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm really happy for him. I mean, yes, he did. Here's a <laughs> huge fan. One drive scoring points in a Ferrari, like, could be meaning that he's so, so amazing, or it could also be a complete fluke, and it could be the car, not the driver. So right. I think it's really going to be a test for him to show that he does belong in that Ferrari after his multi-year deal. Um, but again, Haas is kind of where drivers go for their crews to die. So yeah. I don't know. I'm interested in to see how all that works out. Yeah. And I mean, right now he's in very similar circumstances to Nick DeVries and we all know how that ended. I don't think it's going to be nearly as bad because, you know, obviously DeVries was, you know, subbing in at Williams, not a Ferrari. So it was fully different. Um, But it's, it'll be really interesting to see how it shapes up, how the 2025 car shapes up and, you know, how Ollie is able to come out of the rest of this F2 season, which he hasn't, you know, he, he won the sprint race recently, but he hasn't really been lighting up the the boards. Well, and that's the other thing too, is like everyone coming from F2, who's supposed to be like phenomenal has not been performing well this year. Right. Uh, and then obviously leading into, you know, I want, you want your thoughts on Carlos Sainz and what he's going through right now, because Toto Wolf has basically done a complete 180 and, you know, he's been gung ho Kimi Antonelli for months. Um, and now he says that, you know, Carlos Sainz is, is back on the board. Um, I put in the, um, in our YouTube channel, um, a community post, a poll of which of the four teams that has been quote unquote courting Carlos, you know, should he sign with and, Right now, a bulk of the votes, you know, between the options of Mercedes, Audi, Sauber, Williams, and Alpine, a majority of the votes as the days go by are continuing to push towards, you know, having him go to Mercedes and just doing a straight straight switch with Lewis. Well, yeah. So let's get into, you know, my man Carlos, who doesn't know the definition of soon. Um, He needs to go to Mercedes. Like, I don't know if it's a pride thing and... You know, I don't want to generalize, but I feel like, you know, it it could probably be that um, of why he wouldn't go to Mercedes because they said, like, no, another coming back to him. Mm -hmm. But he can't go to Williams. He knows if he goes to Williams, he's screwing himself. Why would you ever drive for Alpine 
Audi Sauber is so untested and it's new and who knows what's going on. The logical, logical thing, if the offer's on the table, is for him to go to Mercedes. If he doesn't, then he's just an idiot. Like, I'm sorry, but him and his management team, and I know his, like, brothers, his manager, whatever. Like, Cousin. Oh, whatever. They look identical. I mean, um, they're both named Carlos, so it's very hard to tell. There's but. too many Carloses. But, yeah, I just – I think if he doesn't go to Mercedes, he's an idiot. And I, yeah, and I, I think don't if, say that lightly. Like, you are yeah. dumb. If you have – if you have that offer on the table, especially now that the Mercedes is like coming around and mm-hmm. it's not as bad as it was last season, they're really improving. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I think that's the only way for him to be successful. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree. And I, I, I really think that this could explain the delay in Carlos's announcement because Mercedes is still trying to evaluate Antonelli and what they're going to do with Antonelli and whether that answer is give him another year in F2, send him down to Williams or sign him at Mercedes. Um, So there's, you know, there, there are a lot of moving parts in the background that, and that does kind of explain why Carlos hasn't made an announcement yet, though I do hope that we have one, you know, early on in the summer break, or this is probably all we're going to talk about other than, you know, me figuring out, out F101s to to throw together. F101, Carlos signs his family tree. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but here's the thing. But Mercedes too, like, Why would you think you need to continue evaluating Antonelli? Like, Carlos is a tried and tested true driver. He won a race this year. He won a race last year. He's doing really well. He's only a few points behind Charles Leclerc, his teammate, and he sat out an entire race. Like, he's performing very, very well. And so I don't know if it was a, you know, back alley conversation of them saying, like, hey, you know, as of right now, we're not interested. Maybe we'll come back around if things haven't moved. We have to do this. And then maybe he's like, okay, that's still my number one option. So I'm going to keep it open and not make a decision, which I can understand that. But I just don't understand why they wouldn't just go to him and be like, hey, you're our driver next year. And he's like, hey, cool. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. No, I I fully get it. I think that it's I feel like they just need to make, he just needs to make a decision already. I think that Toto needs to, you know, understand that, yes, he's been like full on Antonelli for, for weeks and it's going to look a little awkward to be like, sorry, buddy, but you know, you're still 17. Um, We're going to go with this proven driver who's actually very good and incredibly underrated on the grid. Um, But I just like, it just goes to back to the fact that I don't think Antonelli is ready to go to Mercedes. Like I really just don't think so. He's not, he should not be there. And they just, I don't want to, like, be so harsh about it, but it just would show, like, Toto being an irresponsible team principal. Like, it just – it's not a logical, sound, safe – not necessarily saying it has to be safe, but it's not a logical, sound decision. Yeah. And I think the, the longer that we go on without confirming Antonelli leads me to believe that they're looking elsewhere because I just – you know – Obviously, he Unless they and want to see how he does in more like practice sessions or whatever. But I, don't I know. mean, that's that's definitely an option. But I think that you know he and and Behrman are obviously very similar in that they're both not you know performing very well in F two right now. And I do feel bad for like the top tier guys in F two who are just completely not being considered. Yeah. Um, but I, I really. I just there's there's something that's telling me that they're not going to go with Antonelli and I think that, that that they're correct to not want to go with Antonelli all right so that's our contract update from when I was out and all of my you know unsolicited thoughts, thoughts and feels and opinions um but something else big that happened while I was out during Silverstone weekend is we finally got the movie trailer for the f1 movie called f1 so I'm going to start with my overall thoughts and then we can deep dive into the more specifics of it. Um, one, I think the movie title is dumb and stupid and super confusing and I hate it. And two, we have a trailer for a movie that comes out in a year with five seconds of dialogue and cars going vroom and hearing lots of sound effects. Don't know what the plot is from that trailer, but <laughs> really glad that we have the trailer. And yeah, that's basically the gist of how I feel about it. 
Um, I do have some thoughts and feels on the casting. Do you want me to go into that now, Catherine, or do you want us to cover that later on? Um, let's cover that in, in a minute. Um, cause I do have some things to say about the movie title. I, I, I did a little bit of research and I also watched the trailer about 10 times last night when I was crafting our rundown. Um, so I agree with you. And I said this in our Silverstone recap that I think that they put, they, they were put under a lot of pressure to get a trailer of some sort. And obviously this is the teaser trailer. It's the first thing, um, out as you know, for the Silverstone weekend, because, you know, it was such a big thing last year that they were filming there. So I understand that now about the movie title, um, the movie title originally with the working title was apex and apex GP is the name of the formula one, this fictional 11th formula one team that we're talking about in this movie. Um, but they changed it to just the F1 logo, which I don't love, but I understand a little bit better. And they're basically just use th this entire movie is going to be one giant marketing piece for formula one. So why not call it the sport that they're marketing? Do I love it? No. Does it make sense? Yes. And they also did ver something very interesting in allowing um, the movie to turn the F1 logo silver because Emily, you and I both having our experience yeah. in college athletics, brand standards are hugely important. Like I had a list of like fonts that I was allowed to use for official documentation for, for anything that I was putting out in a press release. And that's the same thing for, you know, we, we couldn't just turn logos, whatever colors we wanted. Um, and so you can't just turn the red F1 logo silver, but they allowed the movie to do that, which is a, a huge deviation from their brand. I hear what you're saying. I don't agree. <laughs> like, I get it. The brand standard thing, totally understand. It is a big deal for them to turn the logo silver. Like when, if you think about it, all of sports in America we do the breast cancer, some sort of breast cancer uniform or logo or whatever to get that approved and through the process is insane. Um, oh, it's such yeah. a process to turn everything pink. It has to be a certain shade and you can have to use everything. Like it's insanity just going through that. Um, so for them to allow someone else to turn the logo a different color, huge, huge deal. I appreciate it. I think the merch that will come out from it will probably be really, really cool. I can see them maybe using the silver logo going forward as well as an alternate to the, to the red, maybe not. Um, but it did look nice, but I just like, I get it that it's this big marketing thing, but there's a caveat to that. Cause it's not just going to be marketing. Um, there's definitely going to be, you know, a, a storyline within the movie that I don't think would necessarily fall in line with F1 traditionally. So I don't know. I don't, I think it's annoying. I think they could have come up with a more creative title. I honestly thought Apex is a good title. Like, you know, Apex as both the team and as an aspect of driving is something yeah. incredibly relevant. Um, but then you also have to remember that you and I know a hell of a lot more about Formula One than most people. Um, so that, you know, the, you know the, they also have to cater to the layman's. Um, and they also have to cater to, you know, people who just want to see a Vroom Car Go Fast movie without the, you know without having to worry about like the technical understanding and, you know, um, and things like safety. And I'll talk about, you know, I have, I have some, a lot more comments about that safety line, um, in the trailer, which we'll talk about in a second, but it's, you know, it has, it, you know, this is a type of movie that's, you know, for everyone and it has to be inclusive. Excuse me and, while you know, I I'm, break my eye sockets in my eye. Oh, no, I am also <laughs> rolling them on the inside, but I'm also in a place where we have to talk about inclusive communities all the time. And I love the place that I am at and the community is very inclusive and I will leave it at that. Um, but, you know, it's not just for the F1 Uber fans. I know, but I, but this is what I struggle with, especially like, when there are sports movies or there are, you know, historical fiction movies, anything like that, or historical nonfiction, whatever, historical movies. When there's people who know about the subject matter a lot, I feel like the obligation is to stay true, as true as possible to whatever it is, to the historical events or to how things actually work in the sport or how things actually work in whatever industry 
versus it just turning into this Hollywood overproduced marketing scheme. I guess right. that's what I'm trying to say. Like, right, and I understand. Just for us, the Uber fans, but I think if they tweak too much, then it's gonna be a complete failure. You know what I mean? Right. Then it, then it, we're running the risk of it being too much of a deviation. It actually, it reminds me of, there's this episode of Hawaii Five O, the the rebooted show that, you know, that was, a, that came out a few years ago, um, where there's an episode where there's a death of the, um, the University of Hawaii women's volleyball coach. And I spend the first 20 minutes of that episode screaming at the TV about how inaccurate it is about college athletics. And like the coach would never shower in the team locker room or, you know, the, the, the girl who the the star player who also has a modeling contract is immediately going to be hounded by compliance and benched because she cannot, at the time she could not make money in that manner and also still be considered an amateur athlete. Um, so I spend a good 20 minutes yelling about how things are wrong. And I will probably do that with this movie upon second viewing, unless it's something glaringly obvious. Like I'm probably just going to take it all in the first viewing and be like, oh my God, that was so much. Um, but then, you know, then I'll watch it again and, you know, focus on the details and be like, ooh, that's wrong. That's wrong. That's inaccurate. Can't do that. Yeah. I don't know. And I think, so moral of the story with the title, I feel like, them titling it F1 is just leaning towards that Hollywood production marketing scheme, which who knows? We have a year to contemplate this and see. And Um, we will. Yes. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But something I am like not hating is the director. Right. So the director is the same director who did Top Gun Maverick which I thought was a really, really good movie. So, and he did a really good job with it. And the sound in that movie was really, really great. And obviously with F1 Cars Go Vroom, um, I think we'll we'll have some really good footage and like stunts and everything like that. I think it'll be well done. Yeah, and then Hans Zimmer, speaking of sound, Hans Zimmer's doing the score and we all know how he reacted um, in Austria. So like- that's that's really exciting. We also have, you know, Jerry Brockheimer is producing, Brad Pitt, Lewis Hamilton, Apple Studios are all also producing. So, like, these are some really big names. And then, obviously, you know, Lewis Hamilton is a current actual Formula One driver. And a lot of the driving forces behind this movie and been existing are through Lewis. Right. And I think, like, going back to our previous soapbox of it staying true, I think having Lewis as a producer is really, really going to help with that. Oh, yeah, fully. I mean, there, there's even from, you know, my 800th viewing of the trailer, there is a lot of, you know, things that look and can be considered as close to accurate as you can get, um, which, you know, we'll, we'll dive into. But you know, really quick to talk about what we know so far about the plot. Um, it's kind of like the typical sports movie type plot. We have a former F1 driver in Brad Pitt who retired from Formula One after a horrible, horrible crash, who was brought back into the sport by a team owner and friend who's going to be played by Javier Bardem, um, who to to come out of retirement and mentor this rookie prodigy named Joshua Pierce, who goes by Noah for some reason. Um, And that's the Damson Idris character at the Expensify Apex Grand Prix team. So right now that's what we know. And I think that from the, what that can tell us is that Apex is not, you know, going to be very high off the grid. And there's some other indications in the trailer um, that also, I think, kind of confirm that. Um, and also, you know, I feel like this rookie prodigy is something, you know, a la Max Verstappen, and Kimi Antonelli type of driver who's like going to be the second coming of Jesus Christ in a Formula One car, but needs somebody to mentor. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sold on the plot. No, I think there's there, there there needs to be like, you know, it can't just be them, you know, racing races and driving, you know, in Formula One without utilizing the other teams on the grid as, you know, opponents. And I don't ne- I don't know how they're going to like give, you know, I don't know who the villain is of this movie. And there needs to be some sort of like villain and it can't just be Brad Pitt's PTSD from the horrible crash that he, you know, suffered from that knocked him out of the sport. Like it, you know, is it Max Verstappen and his continued dominance? Is it Lewis Hamilton being, you know, a seven time world champion? Like what is the actual 
you know, what are the stakes that they're fighting against? Yeah. And, you know, that's all we know from the limited plot because we got absolutely nothing from the uh, teaser trailer. (laughs) I mean, we didn't even get that from the teaser teaser trailer. I got that from like the IMDb page. Yeah. I don't know. Well, we'll see. Again, like I'm I'm not 100% sold. I think the saving grace of this is that Lewis Hamilton, at least for me, is that Lewis Hamilton's a producer. So I know it won't be like too off. But yeah, and I think the the other saving grace of it is the fact that this is being filmed at F one races. Right. Like the, yes. like F one is opening their doors. Um, and I, I have a lot of like fun facts and other things that we'll talk about after we break down the trailer. But I I I feel like the the level of access will also help this movie. But I really want to know what the plot is because I you know the the plot is very vague at the moment. Yeah. Well, speaking of the trailer, let's break it down because you did a very detailed like cut by cut. Of, <laughs> of different things of where it's being filmed and stuff like that so to start us off there's an opening scene with brad pitt and carrie condon who's i think she's playing like the team engineer lead engineer something of the sort yeah um which i have thoughts on um but <laughs> so they're talking back and forth and then about like being faster on the corners than every other team And she's like, but that won't be safe. And Brad Pitt's like, who said anything about safe? And, like, this is just what I mean about, like, Hollywood ruining this for us. Like, well, Brad, let's talk about safety. I'm sure everyone would like to talk about safety. Yeah, you know, the FIA has a lot of things to talk about safety. Roman Grosjean has a lot of thoughts about safety when his car, um, you know, broke into and exploded. Zhou Guan Yu has a lot of thoughts about safety at Silverstone. Like, the, the, there's, you know, all of the drivers who have died have thoughts about safety in Formula One. Like, there's a very important reason why we need to keep this safe. Yeah, like, I get the, you know, dramatic effect of, like, who said anything about being safe? Like, I right. get that. But it's just very unrealistic, especially when, you know, there are so many safety measures that go into making an F1 car. And, like, driver safety is everyone's number one priority I don't know. I think it's a dumb line. I get the drama, the dramatics of it, but I think it's stupid. Yeah, it, it, exactly. I'm like, when when you have safety measures implemented into new regulations based off bad crashes of years past, like we say a lot of things about safety here in Formula One. Um, yeah. But anyway, to, to move forward, then we cut at about 17 seconds into a ton of Silverstone footage. And this is both Silverstone 2023 live and then Silverstone, shown test footage and and post-race footage that I think they just like you know have some animated you know fans that are you know green screened into the background Um, this is not a long trailer Um, and then we got to about um, almost a minute in where we have the 2023 Silverstone National Anthem featuring the drivers featuring the grid kids and featuring Brad Pitt and Damson Idris um, who are live there they were at the anthem they were kind of snuck in right before the anthem started but it was actually kept off the TV broadcast house on purpose so they weren't like digitally entered in which I do think is is one of those elements of like we will see live Formula One stuff happening in the background of a lot of things that are filmed at live races and they didn't just you know use a sound stage yeah because I don't know if we covered or if you guys if you talked about this in the Silverstone recap but they were like filming in the media pin so that mm-hmm. they can have that you know actual in um like live footage in the movie which i think is cool also this is super random and off topic kind of but like brad pitt's not young Mm -hmm. and they started filming this movie last year and now they're picking up filming again like is it visibly going to show that he's aged a year while we're watching this movie like i don't know you're gonna look the same like because when you go from cut to cut like everything for a movie is so particular to make sure that you look the same throughout all of the you know scenes if you're going from a year ago I feel like it's just we might see some cutting or maybe they'll just digitally alter it I don't know there's there's probably going to be some some digital there's some digital altering but there are also like people on film sets whose actual job is to make sure that you look the same that your hair is in the same place as you are from 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 scene to scene and you know there there was a gap in filming during the actor strike um but then they they've picked up and they have continued to make sure that Brad Pitt looks the same you know day, day day to day over you know this past 
you know, year and a half, however long they've been filming and that they're going to continue to film, um, which I have details about, you know, where we're going to see the them on the grid as, as we go on. Um, but I also thought it was really interesting cutting to 54 seconds in. Um, there's a moment where Brad Pitt's car is turning into Eau Rouge in Belgium, which is one of the most historic turns on, on the, the, you know, in the entire F1 grid. And that was actually Pierre Gasly's car. Yeah, I saw that. I saw um, like a side by side of it on Instagram. Yeah, which I think is really cool. And they basically what they did is they so all of the the cars have the cameras on top. That's those little bars. Some of them are yellow. Some of them are black. And that's kind of how you can identify which driver or which car it is for for which driver. Um, And they put a second that was the 4K resolution that they used for filming basically to the left of that camera on um, on Pierre's car um, and then just digitally replaced the car and the helmet and the driver with you know, the Brad Pitt, you know, rendering and colors. Um, so I think that we're going to have a lot of like going back and forth to figure out which Formula One actual car was used in that scene that they just digitally replaced with the Apex GP cars. Yeah. I think it's going to be cool to see some of the racing pieces of the movie to see mm-hmm. how they did it. Cause like, I mean, they they filmed at a bunch of races last year or test tests, drives or whatever and they're filming this year and like we just said f1 is letting them have a bunch of footage and they're opening their doors to whatever they want so i can see them taking you know i more iconic moments or or big things that happened in races and just kind of like digitally switching them yeah yeah it'll be interesting and then the other thing that i noticed is like yes there was some you know racing against other formula one cars like you saw the red bull car you saw a williams car was wondering why we didn't see a ferrari car in the trailer um but there was really mostly the wheel to wheel stuff was between the apex gp cars and i just thought that that was interesting and probably it just means that like the film is just not ready yet which we knew that it wasn't ready when this trailer was released and you're like where is there's very little substance like i said in the you know british gp reaction um it just it's not the best first impression of what will probably be a very good movie yeah i mean or we could look at it you know as that's part of the plot and that's part of the storyline so Mm -hmm. i don't really know until i have more words Exactly. Um, and then I, then I want to talk about the, at the, the 102 mark where somebody on the Apex GP um, pit wall flips off Gunther Steiner and the Haas pit wall. Um, and that's where you have that really great Gunther cameo of him leaning back and kind of having that frowny face that he's got. Um, but you can, if you watch closely, you can see that he's flipping Gunther off. Um, and you can also see I, who I'm like 99% sure is Ayo Komatsu in the foreground of that shot next to Gunther, like actually doing his like doing his job uh, before he was promoted. But I, my, my curiosity, and, and we'll talk about like the cast and the cast roles in, in a minute, but that actor in that bit is a man named um, Joseph Balderamo, who's playing a guy named Rico Fazio. And we don't actually know what his role is, but I'm pretty sure he's going to be either a top level engineer or he's actually the team principal even though um Javier Bardem's character is credited right now as being the team principal but I don't think that's correct interesting yeah I mean I feel like the movie is only a quarter of the way done and they were pressured to get something out and things are going to change and the script will be changed a million times characters will change and yeah I just don't know if we can rely on anything right now (laughs) It's oh so no, really. f- fully. And you know, it, it's Wikipedia. So we, you know, we can only go so far with, with, you know, the information from that I've been able to glean off of Wikipedia. Um, but Javier Bardem's character is listed as the team owner and team principal, but if he's the team principal, he's not going to be watching races from the hospitality suite, which is why I think that this Bal- yeah, Balderrama's character is actually going to be the team principal. Probably. Which, and would make sense if he's going to be flipping Gunther off because we know how team principals tend to banter with each other. And I think... Did Christian Horner flipped off Toto last year on TV? I'm pretty sure it was it was it was Toto that he flipped off, but I know it was Christian Horner. I just love their argument in the uh, team principals meeting. Oh, change your car. change your car. Yeah. 
Yeah. Then we we move on. The the next um, cut is to a Williams car having a massive explosive engine failure while going to wheel to wheel with one of the Apex cars. We don't know who it is, but I'm going to assume it's Brad Pitts. Um, then we go into some pit stop drama, which is very much in line with the, the drama that Sauber has been struggling with at the beginning of the season, though they have been better. But I do want to point out that they did have a 52 second pit stop um, early on the season. Yeah. God bless them and their pit stops. Um, yeah, I don't know. I I think the filming of the pit stops though is is really cool. And and I know that we sent videos back and forth of like coverage of them like rolling wheels and doing mm-hmm. stuff, but it looks a lot better in the uh, in the trailer than I was anticipating. Yeah, the one thing that I did notice that stand, stood out to me and I know will stand out to like a lot of F1 diehards is um, the actors that are, you know, playing these pit stop mechanics are not wearing the correct helmets because it doesn't right. cover their entire face. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's, we're gonna have to live with it. Um, and then, that's a concession I can make. <laughs> exactly. Like we need to see the actors' faces that, you know, like it, it's fine. Um, and then going back to, um, we cut back to, to shots of Brad Pitt, you know, head face on as he's driving. And then we cut to you know his name and he's the only actor in this movie and then we go into the title card that is just f1 summer 2025 yeah so moral of the story i hate the trailer (laughs) and i'm not sold it's i'm i'm not concerned but the trailer was not the best first impression i just bopped the table um but I think it's very interesting. And I think what what else is interesting, some a number of these fun facts that I've been able to dig up is that for the Silverstone race shots, um, Brad Pitt and Dameson Idris are actually driving these cars. So obviously we're going to have a lot of like stunt drivers and, you know, professional drivers who are driving the cars. But at Silverstone, a bulk of those, you know, driving shots are from these guys who they have tested at cars. They've been trained to drive on cars. They won't be winning any F2 races anytime soon, but they are actually driving these cars. Yeah. And I mean, that's kind of in line with um, Joseph Kaczynski who's the director that's what they did in Top Gun Maverick as well like yes there were a lot of stunt um stuntmen helping with the flying but some of the actors were also flying in the movie so that's kind of in line with how he directs movies fully fully um and then to to speak of of directing and filming like they're still filming this movie like they um you know brad pitt and dameson ildris were in the media pen for interviews after qualifying and you know and after like portions of of practices at silverstone of this year like in like in the background of other teams and drivers like you see there's tons of pictures floating around uh, especially of lando norris when he was doing his interviews i believe it was after qualifying and there's brad pitt back there He's just standing there doing his own interviews as a real F1 driver. I just want to know, like, how many presenters we're going to see in this movie that we recognize. I mean, got to get Martin. Like, they got to sneak in, like, a, a two-second thing about the gridwalk. Like, you, you got to have the gridwalk. Um, and, you, you, I mean, Brad Pitt said in an interview last year that he did with Martin that Martin needs a cameo. And I agree that Martin needs a cameo. Um I mean, we'll probably also have a Danica Patrick cameo, but that's, you know, we can, we can survive that. Um, But the, the other little fun fact is the um, Apex GP hospitality suite motor home at Silverstone that they use is actually an old Williams um, mobile home that they've repurposed and rebranded for the movie. So, so, and apparently um, in the video that I watched that was breaking down a little bit of the trailer that was noticed by Danny Ricardo, um, who pointed that out to, to some people, um, which it's fascinating, like the things like, oh yeah, I know that the shape of that motor home. I know exactly who be- belonged to that. So I think that was cool. Um, and then as we know, it, you know, they were supposed to film throughout all of, of last season, um, but then there was that little uh, actor strike that got in the way. But we, we do know that they have filmed the car on track at Hungary, at Monza, at Zanvart, at, at Zanvort, at Spa, Vegas, and Abu Dhabi. Um, we've also had film crews this year at Suzuka. Um, at, they obviously were at Silverstone, and they will also be in Mexico, which I think is great because, you know, what the Mexico City Grand Prix is one of our favorite races. So I really hope that they do have like some good racing bits and feature there because that's one of the coolest tracks on the calendar yeah no it is um i'm 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 glad that they're not just doing like one track like they're really going to multiple doing a bunch of filming getting a lot of you know shots um to really emulate what the year-long schedule looks like you can't just 
you know, drive at Silverstone and then pretend it's Mexico. Like it, like you couldn't <laughs> like Mexico, Abu Dhabi, Vegas, like you, you, you just can't do that. Can't. Um, but it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's very interesting. I, I'm, I'm very interested. I noticed a, but like, I, I, I paused and like looked at like the sponsors that are on these cars. Obviously Expensify is the title sponsor of this team. We also have MSC, which is a big cruise line in Europe, which is a, a big sponsor for a lot of Formula One um, races. Yeah. Geico is, you know, a big insurance company in America. EA Sports, which means there's definitely going to be a video game tie-in. Tommy Hilfiger, which is, you know, a, a massive leisure wear brand in the sport. Um, IWC, Shark Ninja. Um, so they, they've got like real, you know, actual sponsors that are, that are in on this. And obviously that helps with, you know, funding this very expensive movie, which has a massive budget. Yeah, and it just has to keep increasing because because production was delayed. I mm-hmm. I can't imagine how expensive it is going to be to make. Yeah. But. So, I mean, we kind of, you know, teased a bit as, as we talked about what we can assume from the plot. But I'm really curious because, you know, in, in one of the things that I read, it kind of said that, like, the, the other F1 teams will kind of be in the background to the this central story about this team. But, like you need a team to oppose if you're going to say be fighting for a world championship. So I'm really curious about what this means for the plot and what this means for, you know, how this movie is going to be set up and how they're going to navigate about around the fact that they're using, you know, all the other actual drivers on the formula one grid. Like how many lines is Max Verstappen going to have? How, you know, how many times are they going to cut into, to Yuki Sonoda cursing on the radio? Well, we saw them like doing intentional shots with Carlos Sainz last year. Right. Um, so, yeah, I think it's I, I'm interested to know how involved other teams and other drivers will be. And like you said, you're going to you have to have a team that you're competing against. So who is that going to be? And you pointed out that like they're pretty close or it looks like they're pretty close to the Haas pit wall. Um, if you know when they are flipping off Gunther. So if they're that close maybe that's the team that they're competing against maybe Gunther has more of a role in this movie than maybe other people um who knows yeah so speaking of roles in the movie let's talk about really quick what we know of the cast so far so obviously we have Brad Pitt as Sonny Hayes he'll be driving car number nine and then Dameson Idris who will be Joshua Noah Pierce driving car number seven and I was actually curious to like double check to make sure that those weren't cars that are already on the grid driver numbers and they aren't then we have Carrie Condon as Kate who I think is like the team like the principal team engineer um, whose role really reminds me of like Hannah Schmitz from Red Bull like she's like their senior race strategist um, so I think that like that's kind of a little bit of what they ca- they crafted her role from. Um, then we've got Javier Bardem, who plays Ruben, who's the team owner. Um, like I said, he's also listed as a team principal, but I really don't think he is. Um, and Tobias Menzies, who's a guy named Banning, who basically looks like Javier Bardem's hype man. Um, so we'll see what role that guy has and, and what, what points that he has to it. Um, then we have Joseph Balderrama, who I already talked about as Rico Fazio, who I do think is the actual team principal. Um, Sarah Niles, who is from Ted Lasso. She played the, the team sports psychologist, um, who plays Pierce's mother. Um, and then Simone Ashley from Bridgerton fame, um, has just been cast in an unknown role. She was announced on July 9th. We're recording this on the 11th. So we don't really know what she's doing I'm going to assume it's Pierce's love interest because that's you know all I have to go off of um and then you have um there are a few other people in the cast we have Kim Bodina who is playing Casper who I believe is the the pit stop wheel woman from the trailer and then Samson Kayo who's playing a guy named Cashman who I think is going to be Pierce's like buddy you know I think he might play the the Carlos signs um, who is Carlos's manager, Carlos Sainz, not Carlos, you know, not our Car- Carlos, the driver. Um, he is seen in the trailer walk at, walking through the paddock with Pierce. Um, so that's what we know of the cast so far. Obviously we'll have the other, you know, actual Formula One drivers, you know, notable team principals in it, but we, we do have a number of, you know, unknown mystery roles. So it'd be very interesting to see what um, is, you know, how this is all going to come together. And then you also have thoughts on um, Condon, Carrie Condon's character, Kate. Um, so what do you think about that? So I love that they were like, we need to have a woman in a high powerful position on an f1 team all Mm -hmm. for it 
champion. But I just know, based on the five seconds of dialogue that we had and watching it, that they're going to turn this into a, a whole, like, you know, love storyline between her and Brad Pitt. And it's just yep. going to ruin everything for everyone. Like, I'm glad that they did it. But I just, I and I, and maybe they don't. And maybe they'll, you know, be amazing and just let her be a great high power, how powered woman in f1 um but just knowing that this is a movie and you have to you know attract everybody gotta cater to the women i just have a feeling that they're gonna do it and it's gonna make me hate them so much yeah it's you know it's it's not my favorite obviously i am currently dealing with a lot of like men and women can be friends without wanting to sleep with each other um in my own life and it's it's just kind of like can we just you know to to quote Hamilton the musical can we get back to politics please yo and just focus on the sport definitely not focus on politics but anyway um that's that is that is definitely also you know somewhat of a a concern um I think it's a little bit more reasonable to cast someone like Simone Ashley um who's obviously very famous from Bridgerton um in a potential love interest role with Idris's character which I also thought it was you know obviously this is like the Brad Pitt F1 movie but like this is the Brad Pitt F1 movie where he comes back as the washed up has been to mentor this rookie savant. So let's bring a little bit more of the rookie savant into the film other than him throwing his helmet in the garage and being upset. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I have so many thoughts, but they all boil down to like, I'm not sold. (laughs) And I'm sure it's going to be great and we'll all enjoy it. But I think it's just, I just don't, I think they did themselves a disservice by coming out with like this teaser that gave us nothing. Yeah. I mean, honestly, they should have waited until like Vegas to give us a teaser with a little bit more substance, with a little bit more, you know, preparation, you know, down the line, instead of just trying to shoehorn something into Silverstone because Silverstone is the crown jewel of the calendar and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And obviously like Lewis Hamilton won at Silverstone for the ninth time. Like that's a big deal. Obviously they didn't know that was going to happen when the trailer was, you know, dropped 30 minutes before right start. But I do think that, you know, they really, they didn't have to do it this week correct like it's this movie's not coming out for a year we and like we've already spent what 40 minutes talking about what we think we're gonna see in this movie and what impressions we've gotten from this trailer it's we have time yeah i would be so happy to get a trailer like opening opening weekend of next season yeah it's not coming out until what june july of next year so if we get something in like february march i think that's plenty of time why yeah why no, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Yeah. But that's my final thought. Yeah. My, my final thought is I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, this is going to be a fun room car go fast movie that will be very thin on substance. But I think that of anything, it will be a well done representative of, you know, the action that goes into Formula One racing um, that the plot might be a little bit questionable. I- I will accept your final thoughts. <laughs> yeah. And I really hope that they don't cut out the scene where Gunther's in, and the team, probably team principal are flipping each other off on the pit wall. Cause I, I'm, I'm here for that. And the, the Gunther cameo was, was great and definitely was put into the trailer on purpose. No, a hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, everyone seems to be a theme. All we do is talk about things in 2025. Yeah. <laughs> so there you go. Who cares about 2024? Oh, there's Benny one more time. Well, that has been our, uh, from the DMs, breaking down the F1 movie titled F1. It's like a cat named Cat. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, But up next, we will have our Hungarian Grand Prix predictions episode, which will be out on Thursday. We are getting back to more regular scheduled programming now that I am back in the United States. So look forward to that. Thanks for going off track with us, guys.